Hello, this is Dr. Hena Asil, and this is a final review on paper six, which is the alternative to practical in the IGCSE Chemistry Cambridge. So let's take a look at this. The first thing, the basic thing you should know is the names of the apparatus. Of course, the word apparatus is whatever we use, equipment that is used in the lab. So these are, for example, test tubes. Please note the spelling of each one. This one is a conical flask, and please note it's a conical flask. This you can refer to just as a flask. It is called a round-bottomed flask, but you can refer to it as a flask. This is a beaker. This that we use to stir is a glass rod. We don't call it a stirring rod, we call it a glass rod. Uh, this is the funnel which we use for filtration. Um, this is what? A mortar and pestle. This is of course is used for crushing solids. What is this? This is a watch glass. It's not a microscope slide. It's a watch glass. We use it to uh, put solid in or we use it to cover the beaker if the beaker contains uh, something that evaporates easily, a volatile liquid like ethanol, I can cover it with the watch glass. This is a crucible and lid that we use to heat a solid. So I can heat a solid reaction of a metal with oxygen, for example. We do it in a crucible and lid. This, of course, is the Bunsen burner that we use to heat substances in the lab. Uh, this is a dropper to add drops of a liquid. Now, what is this? This is an evaporating dish, which we do, uh, we use for heating solutions, such as when we're doing crystallization, for example. Uh, this, of course, is a balance that we use to weigh anything. And you should be familiar with reading balance. So when he says you should read this and write the result in the table. First of all, please read precisely and notice that we do not put any units inside the table. So don't write 86.0 gram, 84.4 gram. We don't write that. It's already written at the top of the table, so you don't include units inside the table. And notice whether each a uh, division is 0.2 or 0.1 and so on. So that's one at one minute is 84.4, not 0.2. And that last one is 84.1 because it's in between the 84 and the first uh, graduation. And we said each of these is 0.2. What is this? Measuring cylinder. If it has graduations, it's a measuring cylinder. Remember, measuring cylinder is not accurate, so we use it when we're measuring volumes of about something, so about 35 uh, centimeter cubed. Then you use a measuring cylinder, but if we're trying to measure 35.0, we don't use a measuring cylinder. Now, Something that is very similar to the measuring cylinder, but no graduation, it's a gas job. So when we're collecting a gas here, that um, container has graduation, it's a measuring cylinder, while that other one, no graduations, it's a gas job. What is this? Burette. Very accurate and is used to measure any volume. So it measures a wide range of volumes. This is called volumetric pipette, volumetric pipette. Uh, it's accurate, but it measures only specific volumes. So if we're trying to read these readings, these are burette readings. You should remember that the burette is, it has the zero on the top and then we're going down and increasing. So that final reading. Which one is the final reading? The one on the right. Please don't put the final in the in place of the initial. So first in the table he needs final. So the final here is 29.1, not 30 point something. Okay. 
uh, the initial reading, that's the one on the left, that's 24.0. And of course, if he wants the difference, that's just the big one minus the small. Okay, what is this called? This is a tripod band. What is this? Spatula. Of course, the spatula is used to add solid to a reaction. So what is the name of all of this? This one is spatula. This one is glass rod. And that last one is tripod stand. Can you see the tripod stand? Okay, what's the name of this? The big one is the stand. And that one where you attach something to it, that is the clamp. So this is a stand and clamp. Um, what is this? The wire gauze. Can you see the wire gauze? The wire gauze is what we uh, put the flask on. Condenser. Remember condensers, the water goes in from down, goes out from the top. If we're trying to measure volumes of a gas, we use a gas syringe. So can you read the volumes? At time zero, the plunger is all the way inside. That means the volume is zero, no gas. But as the gas collects in the gas syringe, the plunger moves uh, to the right. So that second one at one minute is 45 centimeter cubed. Again, we don't put the units inside the table. And at time two, it is 48 centimeter cubed. Now, what is this? This is tongs. Please note the uh, spelling. We use it to hold a hot crucible, for example, or we use it to, to, to hold hot metal like magnesium. Uh, delivery tube. Can you see which one is the delivery tube? And that big beaker down there, it's not called a beaker, it's called a trough. Can you see what is the bung? The bung is what we use to close the mouth of the flask. Now, what are these? These are funnels that you put at the top of the flask. Now, if it has no tap, it's called a thistle funnel. If it has a tap, it is a dropping funnel. So, what's that first one? That's a thistle funnel, flask, wire gauze, Bunsen burner, tripod stand, delivery tube, gas jar, and that last one is. Okay, so this is what, this is a dropping funnel. If it has a tap, no graduations, it's called a dropping funnel. Of course, that's called the conical flask. And that one on the right is measuring cylinder. Good. Now, he will ask you to suggest some safety precaution. So if he you're supposed to suggest a safety precaution, you need to go back and see what is he talking about. If in his experiment he used ethanol, you should know that ethanol is a flammable liquid. That means it catches fire. And that means if I'm heating it, I tell him heat it in a hot water bath. Or if he's just using it in the experiment, we say do not put the ethanol near an open flame. Okay, if there is no ethanol, then we look for something else. If the experiment has gases, whether it is reacting gases or it is giving out gases, then I should say do the experiment in a fume cupboard. So this is safer so that the uh, student does not breathe in any toxic gases. If not, then we're heating something. We tell him hold the hot objects with tongs. So avoid, avoid burning your hand. Or we wear safety glasses to avoid splashes in the eyes. Or wear gloves if we're handling corrosive substances such as acids or base. What if he says, how do we improve the accuracy of the result? Of course, the easiest way to improve the accuracy of the results is we say repeat each reading and obtain the average. Why? Because the average is more accurate. Or I look at the experiment and see what is he doing. If he's measuring the volume of liquid using a measuring cylinder, I tell him that's not accurate. You should not measure the liquid volume of liquid using a measuring cylinder. You should use a burette because it is more accurate. What if he's measuring volume of gases? Then I should tell him instead of collecting it in a gas jar or a measuring cylinder, I tell him collect the gas in 
a gas syringe to measure the volume of the gas more accurately. What if he's saying I want a dry solid? Then I just tell him dry between filter papers. Why is it that we don't dry it in an oven? We should not dry any crystals in an oven because this may cause it to decompose or we could lose water of crystallization if we have a hydrated solid. When we dry a gas, then I can pass it through concentrated sulfuric acid. So if he has this setup and he says, why are we passing the gas through concentrated sulfuric acid? It is to dry the gas or to remove water from the gas. Of course, we cannot do this for ammonia because remember, ammonia is a base. It will react with the sulfuric acid, so it will not just pass through it and dry, it will react with the sulfuric acid. So I cannot do that for ammonia. So if I want to dry something like ammonia, I can pass it through a U-tube that contains silica gel or what we call anhydrous calcium chloride. So if he says, why are we passing the gas through anhydrous calcium chloride or through silica gel, it is to dry the gas or remove water from the gas. Hazard labels uh, do not come very often, but just notice, please, the label for toxic. So you would see that skull, that label for toxic, on a bottle, for example, of chlorine gas. You should remember that chlorine gas is toxic. Or the label for corrosive, remember that that label for corrosive you will see on an acid or a base. When drawing a graph, we said you plot the points using small x's. Now, if there is a point away from the curve, then that point is referred to as anomalous result. So it's a wrong reading. So I should not include it in the graph. I should not put the graph so that it is going in and out. The graph should be a smooth curve. If a point is away from the curve, then it is an anomalous result. So if we say, why did we choose that as anomalous? It is because it is away from the curve. In paper six, he will tell you what is the appearance of the solid. Or he will say, for example, the solid A is green or solid A is yellow or blue or black. If he says that the solid is uh, colored, it has some sort of color, that means that it has a transition metal. If it does not have a transition metal, then it is white. The solid will be white, or if it's a solution, it will be colorless, and that means that there is no transition metal. Sometimes he says the solid is heated and condensation forms at the top of the tube. When he says that he heated a solid and there is condensation forming at the top of the tube, that tells you that the solid was hydrated. Remember, hydrated means the crystals have water of crystallization in it. When they formed crystals, they took water with them in the crystals. So if you heat it, the water uh, evaporates and it condenses at the top of the tube. How do we collect gases? Well, usually we collect gases over water. And this is for a gas that does not dissolve in water. So if I'm trying to collect oxygen gas or hydrogen gas, I can collect it over water. But if it is soluble in water, then I cannot do that. So ammonia, for example, is soluble in water. I need to collect it by upward or downward delivery. Well, ammonia is lighter than air, so I should collect it by upward delivery. While carbon dioxide is heavier or denser than air, then I should collect it by downward delivery. But if we're trying to collect a gas and measure its volume, then I should collect it in a gas series. Sometimes he has this setup with the delivery tube inside a trough full of water. 
and he says, okay, we are heating that horizontal test tube. When we finish heating, what should we do? We should remove the delivery tube from the water before I remove the Bunsen burner. Why? Because if I leave it as it is inside the water, then there will be back suction of water into the hot tube, which would break it. So my precaution in this kind of experiment is remove the delivery tube before heating is stopped. Or if he says, if it is not removed, what happens? Then there is back suction of water into the hot tube, which would break it. Cotton wool. What do we use cotton wool for? Well, we can use it to hold liquid. So in this kind of setup, I have a liquid. I want to uh, heat it, for example. Then I soak it in mineral wool or cotton wool. So the function of the mineral wool here is to hold the liquid. Or if I have a tube full of solids, I can put a piece of cotton wool at the top of the solids. In this case, it is to prevent any solid from passing through the apparatus. What if I have a mixture that is giving out a gas? So, for example, when we're doing a measurement of a rate, we're trying to determine the rate of a reaction, and we have acid with carbonate, for example, then it's giving out carbon dioxide gas. I want the gas to go out, but I don't want to lose any liquid by splashing, so we put a piece of cotton wool. A suction pump is used in some experiments. This is just to suck the gases through the apparatus. So I have gases coming out from that burning fuel. I need to collect all of these gases and pass it into the test tube. So we use a suction pump to pull the gas through the delivery tube into the liquid. An airlock is used to allow gases to go out, but no gas can come in. So for example, in fermentation, I need to allow the carbon dioxide to go out, but I don't want any oxygen because fermentation is in absence of oxygen. So I don't want any oxygen to go in, so I use what is called an airlock. When we do experiments and we're measuring temperature, well, for some experiments, the temperature at the beginning starts to go down. And for some experiments, the temperature starts to rise. First of all, if he says, what is the type of reaction? Well, if the temperature decreases, then that is an endothermic reaction. If the temperature increases, that is exo. But then if I finish the experiment and I leave it and I come back after an hour, what would be the temperature of my experiment? Well, after an hour, then the temperature will go back to what it originally was because it will go back to room temperature. So whatever we started with, we will go back to it in order to return to room temperature since the reaction has finished. When we do an experiment involving measurement of temperature, I should not do it in a beaker. So if he says he did it in a beaker, that's wrong. What should he improve or what kind of improvement can he do? He can do the experiment in a polystyrene cup because polystyrene is an insulator, so there will be less loss of heat to the surrounding. What if he already did it in a polystyrene cup? What kind of improvement can he do? Well, he can cover it with a lid. Can you see that? Or we say he can insulate the apparatus. Insulate means he su surrounds it with something that prevents loss of heat to the surroundings. Reading a stopwatch. You should know how to read a stopwatch. So the inside, he already usually tells you that the circle inside is minutes and the circle outside is seconds. And usually he wants you to put the result in the table in the form of seconds. So, one minute, this one is what? One minute and 26 seconds when I want to record it in the table. 
I need to change all of this to seconds, so that means 60 plus 26. So I write in the table 86 seconds. So for example, that first uh, stopwatch, what does it read? This is two minutes and eight seconds, so that is 128 seconds. Or experiment two, it was what? It was 58 seconds. There are no minutes, so it's 58 seconds. That third one is what? 27 seconds. Are we okay so far? We have reliable, valid, accurate, precise, anomalous. A result is reliable if I repeat it and get the same result. Then we say it's reliable. It's valid if it's measuring what I intend to measure. Accurate if it is near to the true, true, true reading. So if the reading is supposed to give to be whatever, 20, and I got it near to that reading, then my reading is accurate. Precise means they, I get the same reading under the same conditions. So all the readings are near, very near to each other. Anomalous means the measurement does not fit the curve or my point is away from the curve. How do we separate mixtures? Well, filtration we use to separate insoluble solid from a mixture. So if I have sand in water, then I do filtration. Remember, the insoluble part is the one that remains in the filter paper and it's called the residue. And the liquid is the one that goes down into the conical flask and it is the filtrate. Please learn how to draw the label diagram of this because sometimes he asks you to draw the label diagram for filtration. So let's take a look at this. Of course, you know that at the end of paper six, there's usually an investigation. And this is usually for uh, five or six or seven marks. Um, so this is very important that you explain this investigation in detail. So this one is saying beach sand is a mixture of sand and broken shells made of calcium carbonate. So the shell is calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate reacts with dilute hydrochloric acid to form a solution of calcium chloride. Plan an investigation to find out the percentage of shell material in a given sample of beach sand. So I have beach sand, which is sand and calcium carbonate, and I want to know how much calcium carbonate. So what should we do? Please think about this and decide the order in which you're going to explain it. So the first thing I need to do, if I want to know how much something, that means I need to weigh at the beginning. Then I put the uh, mixture into what? He says the calcium carbonate will dissolve in hydrochloric acid, but not the sand. So I put it in hydrochloric acid and whatever does not dissolve, I can filter out and measure the amount of sand. And from that, I can get the amount of shell. So this is the explanation that we should do. Weigh something specific. So let's say weigh 10 grams of beach sand using a bath. Put into a beaker. Add excess dilute hydrochloric acid. Stir with a glass rod. Notice I'm explaining using apparatus. Calcium carbonate dissolves. Bubbles of carbon dioxide gas are given off. Then we filter through filter paper and funnel. So the sand is collected as a residue. Dry the residue between filter papers, weigh the residue, so now I'm weighing the sand, and then I can subtract from the original mass in order to calculate the percentage of carbonate that was present. This is another investigation. He's saying copper to oxide and carbon are both black solids. Copper oxide reacts with dilute sulfuric acid to form aqueous copper sulfate. That just tells you that the copper oxide dissolves in sulfuric acid, but the carbon does not. You are given a mixture of copper oxide and carbon. So already your beaker contains both carbon dioxide and carbon, access to dilute hydrochloric acid, and you want to plan an experiment to investigate the percentage of 
copper oxide in the mixture. So this is very similar to the previous experiment. We're going to weigh a certain amount of the mixture using a balance, put the mixture into a beaker. Here he's saying sulfuric, so just add excess sulfuric acids there with a glass rod, filter through the filter paper and funnel. Wash the residue with a few drops of distilled water. Dry the residue between filter paper. Weigh using a balance. Subtract from the original mass and calculate the percentage. So this is basically the same kind of experiment. Another one here says a toothpaste contains sodium fluoride, calcium carbonate, silica, and mint flavoring. Sodium fluoride and the mint flavoring are soluble in water. The calcium carbonate and the silica are insoluble in water. Now, calcium carbonate reacts with dilute hydrochloric acid to form a soluble salt. What does he want? Plan an investigation to find the percentage by mass of silica. So if I can remove sodium fluoride and the mint and the calcium carbonate, then what is left is the silica. In your answer, you should include how you will calculate the percentage by mass of silica in the toothpaste. So basically, we're trying to dissolve the sodium fluoride and the calcium carbonate and the mint to leave the silica behind. So what should we do? Again, weigh 5 grams of toothpaste using balance. Put into a beaker. Add dilute hydrochloric acid that will remove the carbonate. Okay, until no more bubbles of gas are given off. And then filter through filter paper and funnel. If he says that the sodium fluoride and the mint are soluble in water, they will automatically dissolve in the dilute hydrochloric acid. So actually, the dilute hydrochloric acid has removed the calcium carbonate, sodium fluoride, and mint. And whatever did not dissolve is the silica. So when I filter, the silica is collected as residue. Wash the silica with a few drops of distilled water, dry between filter papers, and weigh. And you subtract from the original mass and calculate the percentage of silica. Of course, to calculate the percentage, it is the mass of silica over the initial mass times 100. Because he says you should show how you calculate the percentage. Another example, calcium carbonate is found in limestone and in marble. All carbonates react with hydrochloric acid to form chloride. Calcium carbonate is insoluble in water, but calcium chloride is soluble. Most impurities in limestone and marble are insoluble. So we have marble and we have limestone, and both of them have calcium carbonate. The calcium carbonate will dissolve in uh, acid, hydrochloric acid, but the impurities will not. And he's trying to plan an experiment to find out which of the limestone and marble contain more impurities. So this is basically the same. I have to weigh 10 grams, for example, of the first one, of the limestone using a balance, put into a flask. Then what should I do? He says the carbonates react with, with hydrochloric acid to form chlorides that are soluble. So that means that the carbonate will dissolve in hydrochloric acid. So add excess dilute hydrochloric acid, stir using a glass rod until no more bubbles of gas are given off. Then we filter. So whatever remains in the filter paper is the uh, impurity. Now, wash the residue with a few drops of distilled water, dry between filter paper, and weigh the residue. And then you're going to repeat using the same mass of the other one, the marble, and the one that has more residue has more impurity. Please practice explaining all of these. So another kind of separation method is crystallization, and you should know that we use crystallization if I have a solution and I want the dissolved salt. So if I have a solution and I want the salt from the solution, then heat to point of crystallization, cool to form crystals, filter through filter paper and funnel, and dry the crystals between filter paper. Of course, how do I know that I have reached point of crystallization? 
We say insert a glass rod into the hot solution and remove it. Crystals should form on the tip. When you heat to point of crystallization, the solution that you form is called a saturated solution. So if we say what is meant by saturated solution, it is one in which no more solid can dissolve at a certain temperature. So this is another investigation. He says ethane dioic acid dihydrate is a white crystalline solid. This acid is water soluble. It's found in rhubarb leaves. Plan an investigation to obtain crystals of the acid from the leaves. So he gives you leaves and he says get the water soluble acid from it. What should you do? Of course, if you have leaves, he says you're provided with common laboratory apparatus, water and sand. Why does he give you sand? You should remember that when you're crushing leaves, they become very slimy. So to help in crushing them, we crush it with sand. And then I add what he said, it's soluble in what? In water. So I add water, dissolve the solution from the leaves. So crush the leaves with some sand in mortar and pestle. Put it into a beaker and add water. Stir with a glass rod. That means that in my beaker now I have the rest of the leaves. So what should I do? Filter through filter paper and funnel. So I'm trying to get rid of the leaves and the sand. Then heat the filtrate to point of crystallization. Cool. Filter the crystals. This will give me the crystals of the acid that was in the leaf. A mixture contains three solid compounds, copper sulfate, cetyl alcohol, silicon dioxide. He's telling me that some of them are soluble in water and some of them are soluble in propanone. Plan a method to obtain a pure sample of each of the three solids, copper sulfate, cetyl alcohol, and silicon dioxide from the mixture. You have access to normal laboratory apparatus. So, you want to separate them, basically. How do we separate them? If we look at water, for example, only copper sulfate is soluble in water. So if I add water to the mixture, I, I dissolve copper sulfate. Now, if I'm left with the cetyl alcohol and silicon dioxide, I can add what to separate them? I can add the propanone because one of them is soluble in propanone and the other is not. So this is what you do. Put the mixture in a beaker, add water and stir. So which one will dissolve? Copper sulfate dissolve. So you filter that through filter paper and funnel, heat the filtrate to point of crystallization, cool, filter the crystals, you get copper sulfate. Okay, wash with a few drops of distilled water, dry between filter papers, you end up with copper sulfate crystals. Then you're left with the rest of the mixture that was a residue. So what do we do to the residue? This contains cetyl alcohol and silicon dioxide. So I'm going to put them into a beaker. Add propanone and stir. Now, if I add propanone, which one will dissolve? The cetyl alcohol dissolves. Then I filter through filter paper and funnel. The silicon dioxide is obtained as a residue. Wash the residue with distilled water. Dry between filter papers. This gives me the silicon dioxide. Then if I take the filtrate, Heat in an evaporating dish, I end up with cetyl alcohol since the propanone will evaporate. Are we following what we're doing? This is another one. Potassium chloride is a salt that dissolves in water. The solubility of a salt is the mass in grams of the salt that dissolves in 100 centimeter cubed of water at a particular temperature. Please note that this is definition of solubility. So if he says, what is the definition of solubility? It is the mass in grams of the salt that dissolves in 100 centimeter cubed of water. Remember, 100 centimeter cubed of water is the same as 100 grams of water. Plan an investigation to determine the solubility of potassium chloride in water at 40 degrees Celsius. So I want to know how much potassium chloride will dissolve in water at 40 degrees Celsius. So what should we do? 
put 100 centimeter cubed of water in a beaker using a measuring cylinder. Heat to 40 degrees Celsius because that's the temperature specified. Now, we're going to weigh a big amount of potassium chloride, let's say 100 grams of potassium chloride, using a balance. Add to the water and stir. Of course, when you stir at 40 degrees, as much of it as possible will dissolve. But whatever does not dissolve, you filter, dry the residue, weigh using a balance, subtract from the original mass, then you know how much dissolved in the water. Okay? When do we do simple distillation? Remember that simple distillation, we need to obtain pure water from a solution. So if he says I have salt water or salt solution or sodium chloride solution or whatever, and I want the water, then I do simple distillation. Remember, we have a thermometer to measure the boiling point of the liquid. And we have a condenser. Can you see the direction of cold water going in from the bottom and going out of the, from the top? If he says, what is the function of the condenser? To cool and condense the vapor. Now, why is the cold water going in from down and out from the top? To make sure that the condenser is full of water for more efficient cooling. So this is a question, describe how simple distillation is used to separate water from an aqueous solution of sodium sulfate. In your answer, refer to the apparatus used, changes in state, difference in boiling points, and you may use a diagram. So he's talking about simple distillation. We said what is happening in simple distillation, put the solution into a flask, connect it to a condenser, heat the solution in the flask. Now. Why is it that water is the one that comes out and not the sodium sulfate, for example? Water has a lower boiling point than the sodium sulfate because he's telling me difference in boiling point. So it boils first and turns into vapor. The vapor goes into the condenser where it cools and condenses to form pure water and is collected in a receiving flask or in a conical flask. This is what happens for simple distillation. We get the water from the solution. When do we use fractional distillation? We use fractional distillation to separate a mixture of liquids that have different boiling points. So we have here the difference between the simple distillation and fractional distillation is that here we have a fractionating column. Can you see the fractionating column? And the one with the lower boiling point is the one that is collected first. So if he says, what is the name of these? Well, that's a thermometer. This is called what? Fractionating column. And of course, this is the condenser. Which liquid will be collected first? Well, he tells me that ethanoic acid has a boiling point of 118. Chloroethanoic acid has a boiling point of 190. So which one will be collected first? the one with lower boiling point. How will the teacher know when all of this has been collected? Now, when the ethanoic acid boils off at 118, while it is boiling off, the temperature remains constant at 118. But once all the ethanoic acid has been collected, then the temperature starts to rise. So when the temperature starts to rise, then I know that all the ethanoic acid has been collected, so I change the beaker and bring a new beaker to collect the other fraction. So just why small beads, small glass beads are used in fractionating column instead of large glass beads? Remember, if he says small something instead of large something, that is because the small has larger surface area, whatever he's talking about. So here he's saying we're going to put small beads instead of Large beads, it's because the small has larger surface. Paper chromatography. We said if I have a dye or a food uh, coloring and I want to know, or ink, and I want to know how many colors, then I do paper chromatography. I put a spot of the sample on the baseline near the bottom of a rectangular chromatography paper. Put the spot of the sample on the baseline first, 
and then you put the paper into a beaker containing a small amount of solvent. Now, which solvent are we going to use? If we're talking about ink or food coloring, then it is water. Other things that are not soluble in water, then my solvent is ethanol. Allow the solvent to move up the paper. Once the solvent has moved up the paper to the top, the place where the solvent stopped at the top of the paper is called the solvent front. Can you see where the solvent front is? That's where the solvent went up to the top of the paper. Now, what if I want to know which substance I have? If I want to know which substance I have, then I can put a spot of my sample with spots of things that I already know. So here I want to know my substance A. Does it have compound 1 or compound 2 or compound 3? I put spots of all of this next to each other on the baseline, put them into the beaker containing a small amount of the solvent, if the spots go up the same height, they are the same. So this shows that compound A has 1, has compound 1. Or I can use RF values. Remember that the RF value is the distance traveled by the spot over the distance traveled by the solvent. So I measure either with my ruler or he sometimes writes a ruler next to the a diagram of the chromatogram, and I measure from the baseline to the middle of the spot divided by from the baseline to the solvent front. Can we see that? That is called the RF value. So, if he says diagram shows the results of an experiment to separate and identify the colors present in two colored mixtures A and B, name this method of separation. What is this method of separation? This is called chromatography. Draw a line on the a diagram to show the level of the solvent at the beginning of the experiment. So where is my solvent at the beginning of the experiment? We said it has to be below the baseline or it is called the origin line. My solvent should be below that. And if he says, why is it below the baseline? To avoid dissolving the spots in the solvent so that the spots do not dissolve in the solvent. Now, why should a pencil be used instead of a pen to draw the origin line? The baseline or the origin line should be drawn in pencil. Why? Because pencil has graphite. Graphite does not dissolve in water, while ink would dissolve in water. This investigation says an orange drink may contain artificial colors, E110, and E129, plan an investigation to determine the presence of these artificial colors in a sample of orange drink. So he gave you a sample of orange drink and he wants to know, does it have what he calls E110 or E129 or not? What do we do? We do chromatography. We put a spot of the drink next to a spot of the things we're looking for on a baseline near the bottom of a rectangular filter paper. Then put the paper into, remember you put the spots first and then you put the paper into the beaker. Containing what? Containing a very small amount of water. Don't say a beaker full of water. It's not full of water, it has a small amount of water below the baseline. Allow the water to move up the paper. If the orange drink has spots the same height as the artificial colorings, then they are present. If the spots are not the same height, then they are not present. Then uh, this is another kind of question where he gives you the list of techniques and he says which one should you use to obtain water from aqueous magnesium sulfate. So I'm trying to get the water from a solution. We used which method to get water from a solution? We use simple distillation. What about glycine from a mixture of amino acids, glycine and lysine? Remember, when we want to separate a mixture of amino acids or a mixture of sugars, we use chromatography. I want to separate iron fillings from a mixture of iron fillings and water. You should remember that iron fillings are small pieces of iron. Of course, these will not dissolve in water. So if I'm trying to separate them from water, then I use filtration. 
zinc sulfate crystals from aqueous zinc sulfate. So I have the solution and I want the solid from it. Then this is what, this is by crystallization, but he doesn't have crystallization in the list. He has evaporation, so that is the same thing. Hexane from a mixture of liquids. We said, how do we separate a mixture of liquids that have different boiling points? Fractional distilling. Okay, what's an acid and what's a base? You have to know the definition. Acid is a proton donor. That means it gives H plus ions. Base is a proton acceptor because it dissolves in water to give hydroxide ions. So if he says, what is the ion present in an acid it is h plus ion <clears throat> the ion present in a base or in an alkali is oh minus to determine if something is an acid or a base we use an indicator and we said definition of an indicator is it's a substance that has different colors in acids and bases so which indicators do we use? We use litmus paper, universal indicator paper, thymolphthalein, and methyl orange. If we want to know if something is an acid or a base, we just put litmus paper. In acid, it turns red. In base, it turns blue. But if I want to know the exact pH of a solution, I insert universal indicator paper and compare the color to the chart insert universal indicator paper and compare the color to the chart if the solution is neutral its ph is 7 so the universal indicator paper will be green if it is a strong acid it's just like litmus it will be red if it's a strong base, it is like litmus, it will be blue. If it is a weak acid, it's orange or yellow. Please learn these pHs. If we're doing titration or a solution in which we need an indicator that's a liquid, then we can use either thymolphthalein or methyl orange. And you have to know, if I have a base in my flask, I add thymolphthalein, it's blue. If I add methyl orange, it's yellow. Now, if I uh, change the pH, add acid so that it becomes neutral, then the thymolphthalein will turn from blue to colorless. If it were methyl orange, it will turn from yellow to orange. So this question says the leaves of some trees contain colored substances which can be used as pH indicators. These colored substances are soluble in ethanol but insoluble in water. You should assume that nothing else in the leaves is soluble in ethanol. Plan an investigation to do what? To extract the colored substances from some leaves and test them to see if they work as a pH indicator. You have leaves. What should you start doing with the leaves? You should crush the leaves using a mortar and pestle. Then he's saying the colored substances are soluble in ethanol. So you should put it into a beaker, add ethanol, and stir. Then what? The color will dissolve in the ethanol. And the rest of the leaves and the sand or whatever you're crushing, you need to get rid of it. So we're going to filter through, filter paper and funnel. And I take what? I take the filtrate. Now, I want to determine if the filtrate is an indicator. So I'm going to put a little bit of the filtrate on an acid and a little bit on a base. If it is an indicator, it should have different colors in acids and bases. That was the definition of indicator, something that changes color if you put it in acid or a base. How do we prepare salts? We said the method depends on whether the substances we're using or the substances we're making are soluble or insoluble. Which substances are soluble? Please remember. All nitrates are soluble. 
sodium, potassium, ammonium salts, soluble. All acids are soluble. Barium chloride and copper sulfate is soluble. You will assume that most of the other things are insoluble. So, carbonates, for example, are insoluble. Barium carbonate, calcium carbonate, these are insoluble. Silver chloride, silver bromide, silver iodide, all of these are insoluble. That means they form precipitates or they are solid. Lead chloride, lead bromide, lead iodide, all of these are insoluble. Barium sulfate is insoluble. Copper oxide is insoluble. So copper oxide is a black solid. All metals are insoluble. So to prepare the salt, we choose. Are we going to explain titration or neutralization or precipitation? In titration, everything is soluble. I'm using soluble compounds to prepare something that is soluble. In neutralization, I am starting with insoluble. In precipitation, I am making an insoluble salt. So in titration, everything is soluble. We said sodium salts are soluble. So if I react sodium hydroxide with HCl, that forms sodium chloride. And that is my product that I want, but we don't know how much acid I should add to how much base. So we do this titration in which we put a specific amount of sodium hydroxide in a flask using a volumetric pipette. Add three drops of an indicator. So you could use thymorphthalein or methyl orange. If we put thymorphthalein on sodium hydroxide, we said the solution will turn blue. Then you start adding dilute hydrochloric acid from a burette until the blue color turns colorless. Note the amount of acid used. So now I know how much acid I should add to the 25 centimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide. I will repeat by adding the required amount of acid to the same volume of sodium hydroxide but without using an indicator. Then we do crystallization because once I add the required amount of acid to the base, what I have is sodium chloride solution. Heat the solution to point of crystallization, cool, filter the crystals, wash with a few drops of distilled water and dry between filter papers. You should remember that when we read a burette, the eyes should be on the same level as the meniscus. The meniscus is that uh, curved po uh, upper part of the liquid, and we read the bottom of the meniscus. When doing a titration, the flask should be placed on a white tile or a white paper, and this is to see the color change clearly. We also should do what? The flask should be swirled while adding the solution from the burette, to mix the contents as we do the titration. Remember that in a titration experiment, if we've done one titration, then I want to do another one, the burette should be rinsed twice. We should rinse. Of course, rinse means I should wash the burette with water to remove traces of the previous solution that I used. And then I should wash it with the solution that I'm going to fill it with to remove the water. Remember, we wash it with water to remove the previous solution. And then we wash it with the substance I'm going to fill it with to remove the water. Then we said, if we have two solutions, solution A and solution B, and I want to know which one is more concentrated, then I can do titration, each of them with a certain acid, let's say dilute HCl. If A uses more of the acid than B, then A is more concentrated. The one that uses more of the solution from the burette is the more concentrated. But if I put two different solutions in a burette and I'm titrating it with a certain amount of the same solution of sodium hydroxide, now or the same concentration of sodium hydroxide, then if acid A, I needed only a small amount of it, or in this case, acid A, I used a lot of it, and acid B, I needed only a small amount. 
then which one is more concentrated the one that i need a small amount of that is the more concentrated so in this case a is less concentrated i needed to use more of it in the titration please study all of this now another investigation he says oven cleaners contain an aqueous solution of sodium hydroxide plan an investigation to show which of the two different oven cleaners contains more concentrated solution of sodium hydroxide so i have two solutions of sodium hydroxide and i want to know which one is more concentrated you are provided with common laboratory apparatus and chemicals so we said if i have two solutions of sodium hydroxide and i want to know which one is more concentrated then i can do titration for each of them and the one that will need more acid is more concentrated so we say put 25 centimeter cubed of the first sodium hydroxide solution into a flask using a volumetric pipette. Add three drops of thymorphaline, the solution turns blue. Then we add dilute HCl from a burette until the blue color disappears. Note the volume of acid used. And then I'm going to repeat it with the same volume of the other alkali solution. The one that uses more acid is more concentrated. The other method of preparing salts is neutralization. And this is if I'm starting with something that's a solid. So I'm trying to make copper sulfate, for example. Then I need copper oxide plus sulfuric acid. Copper oxide is a black solid. Of course, I cannot say just copper plus acid because copper alone will not react with acid. So I'm using copper oxide. How are we going to do this? We're not doing titration because the copper oxide is not soluble. So I need to do it in a different method. I put acid into a beaker. I add the copper oxide using a spatula until excess solid remains in the beaker. So we add solid copper oxide using a spatula to 25 centimeter cubed of sulfuric acid in a beaker until excess solid remains in the beaker. Now, I know when I see excess solid in the beaker, I know that the reaction has finished. So I filter and the excess solid is what I get as a residue. So I don't want it. I want the solution. I take the solution and I do crystallization. So heat the filtrate to point of crystallization, cool, filter the crystal. Okay. What if we're trying to make something that is insoluble? So I'm trying to make silver chloride. Silver chloride is not soluble. It will form a precipitate. So all I need to do is add two solutions together, silver something and something chloride. So we said all nitrates are soluble. Uh, sodium salts are soluble. So if I add silver nitrate solution to sodium chloride solution, I get a white precipitate of silver chloride. Now, the precipitate is what I want. So add silver nitrate solution to sodium chloride solution in a beaker. Silver chloride forms as a white precipitate. Then I filter, and in this case, it is the residue that I want. It is the precipitate that I want. Wash the residue with a few drops of distilled water. Dry the residue between filter. So if he has a question like this, he's saying three ways of making salts are titration, neutralization, precipitation. Complete the following table. So the first method, I want to use titration to make sodium nitrate. Which reagents should I react together? I want sodium something and something nitrate, and they all have to be soluble. So it is a base with an acid, sodium hydroxide, and nitric acid will give sodium nitrate. What if I'm trying to do neutralization? Neutralization means one of my reagents is a solid. So I'm trying to make copper nitrate. I can make it from copper oxide or copper carbonate. In precipitation, the silver chloride that I'm trying to make is insoluble. So I need to start with two things that are soluble. So it has to be silver nitrate and sodium chloride or HCl. Neutralization means I am starting with what? One of my reagents is 
a solid. So zinc carbonate is a solid. I'm reacting it with sulfuric acid. My salt that I'm trying to make is zinc sulfate. Then we need to talk about tests. These tests will be given to you in a list at the end of paper six, but you still need to study. So let's go through it very quickly. To test for carbonate, you add acid. So be specific, dilute hydrochloric acid, for example. This gives bubbles of gas that turn lime water milky. That's my observation. If he asks me what is the name of the gas, it is carbon dioxide gas. Test for halides, chloride, bromide, iodide. For all of them, I'm going to add dilute nitric acid and silver nitrate. But chloride gives white precipitate, bromide gives cream precipitate, iodide gives yellow precipitate. What was the test for nitrate? I add sodium hydroxide, then aluminum foil, warm gently. I get bubbles of gas that turn damp red litmus paper to blue. And if he asks what is the name of the gas, it is ammonia. Test for sulfate. What was the test for sulfate? Add dilute nitric acid, then barium nitrate. Barium nitrate is the test for sulfate, and it should give a white precipitate if I have sulfate. Of course, if I don't have sulfate, then I will tell him no change or no reaction or no effect. What was the test for sulfite? Test for sulfite was add acid but warm gently. So add dilute hydrochloric acid and warm gently. I will get bubbles of gas that turn acidified potassium manganate from purple to colors. What is the name of the gas? The gas is sulfur dioxide. So this is the test for sulfur dioxide gas. But if I pass it through acidified aqueous potassium manganate, it turns from purple to color. Test for aluminum ions. What was the test for aluminum ions? White precip add sodium hydroxide. Remember uh, the cations, I either add sodium hydroxide or aqueous ammonia. Now for aluminum, if I add sodium hydroxide, I get what? white precipitate. Then if I add excess, the precipitate is soluble in excess, giving a colorless solution. What if I add aqueous ammonia to aluminum ion? I get a white precipitate insoluble in excess. That means the white precipitate. And then if I add excess of aqueous ammonia, the precipitate remains. Test for ammonium ions. We add sodium hydroxide on warming. I get bubbles of ammonia gas that give uh, that turn damp red litmus paper to blue. Please be familiar with these tests. Don't rely on the fact that you're going to have the list of tests at the end of the exam so that you don't waste time and sit down and look for it. What is the test for calcium ions? Calcium ions add aqueous sodium hydroxide. I get what? White precipitate insoluble in excess with aqueous ammonia no precipitate or very slight white precipitate test for chromium ions what was the test for chromium add aqueous sodium hydroxide we get a green precipitate soluble in excess with aqueous ammonia a gray green precipitate insoluble in excess Test for copper 2 with sodium hydroxide, light blue precipitate, insoluble in excess. With aqueous ammonia, light blue precipitate, soluble in excess, giving a dark blue solution. Test for iron 2 with both of them, either sodium hydroxide or aqueous ammonia, we get a green precipitate, insoluble in excess. For iron 3, whether I'm adding sodium hydroxide or aqueous ammonia, I get a red-brown precipitate insoluble in excess. Test for zinc. Add aqueous sodium hydroxide or aqueous ammonia. In both cases, I get white precipitate soluble in excess, giving a colorless solution. 
What was the test for gases? To test for ammonia gas, we insert damp red litmus paper. It turns to blue. Carbon dioxide gas, bubble the gas through lime water. Remember that lime water is actually calcium hydroxide. The lime water turns milky because it forms calcium carbonate. Test for chlorine gas. And remember, don't mix this up with the test for chloride. Test for chlorine, insert damp blue litmus paper, it bleach. Test for hydrogen gas, insert a lighted splint, it pops. Test for oxygen gas, insert a glowing splint, it relights. What were the flame tests? Clean. A First of all, in order to do a flame test, clean a platinum wire by dipping it in concentrated HCl. Dip the wire in the salt. Expose the wire to what? Expose the wire to the hot or the blue flame of the Bunsen burner. Observe the emitted light. You have to remember these colors or it will be at the end of your paper. That's okay. Lithium is red, sodium yellow. Potassium lilac, calcium is brick red or orange red, don't say just red. Barium is green, copper is blue green. What was the test for water? We have chemical tests and physical tests. The chemical test, either I add anhydrous copper sulfate, it turns from white to blue. Or we add anhydrous cobalt chloride, it turns from blue to pink. Remember the word anhy anhydrous means it doesn't have water. Hydrated means it has water of crystallization. The physical test for water, heat the liquid to boiling. It should boil at 100 degrees Celsius. What was the test for alkenes? Add bromine water. It turns from reddish brown to colorless, or we say from orange to color. What was the test for ethanol or organic flammable liquid? If he says that he put a lighted splint near the liquid and the liquid catches fire, that means it is an organic flammable liquid. Ethanoic acid. Remember that ethanoic acid is actually vinegar, so its appearance is colorless liquid and its smell is smell of vinegar. And then you have... These colors, you're supposed to know these colors. These are the colors that you should know. So please be familiar with them. So if we look at this question, it says three bottles of liquids have lost their labels. And I want to distinguish between them. So outline chemical tests. Now, how do I know if something is something chloride, potassium chloride? What was the test for? Uh, chloride, add dilute nitric acid and aqueous silver nitrate, I should get a white precip. What about ethanol? What was the test for ethanol? Ethanol, we said, is a flammable liquid. To so put a lighted splint near the liquid, the liquid catches fire. What about sodium hydroxide solution? Sodium hydroxide solution, we're going to use one of the things that it's used to test. So we use sodium hydroxide to test for copper too. That means I can use copper 2 sulfate to test for sodium hydroxide because I know if I add copper something to sodium hydroxide, it should give a blue precipitate. This question says a mixture of two solids, G and H, was analyzed. G was water soluble and H was copper carbonate. The tests on the mixture and some of the observations are so. So the first test says to the filtrate, he added dilute nitric acid and silver nitrate. And the first thing you ask yourself, silver nitrate was test for what? If you remember, it was test for halide. So if G was tested with silver nitrate and it gave a white precipitate, that means it has chloride ions. Now he's saying to the filtrate, dilute sulfuric acid was added. Now, if I add sulfuric acid to something and it gives me white precipitate, that means I have what? Sulfuric acid is something that has sulfate. What was the test for sulfate? The test was for sulfate was at barium nitrate. It gives a white precipitate. 
So if I add sulfate to something and it gives me white precipitate, then it is barium something. Do we understand this? The test can be used in reverse. So we use barium nitrate to test for sulfate. That means if I add sulfate and I get the white precipitate, then that something is barium ion. Then he says the residue. What was the residue? The residue, he says, H was copper carbonate. So this is copper carbonate. A little of the residue was put into a test tube and dilute nitric acid added. Of course, now he's adding acid to something that is a carbonate. The gas was tested. So if I add acid to carbonate, what do I see? I see bubbles of gas because it will give carbon dioxide gas. And the gas tested, how do we test for carbon dioxide gas? It turns lime water milk. Then, remember he's saying I have copper something. So to the first portion, an excess of sodium hydroxide was added. If I add sodium hydroxide to something that has copper, what should I see? Blue precipitate. To the second portion, a few drops of aqueous ammonia was added. Now, if I add ammonia to copper too, I should see at the beginning blue precipitate. And then when I add excess, the blue precipitate dissolves to form dark blue solution. So he's saying, what conclusion can you draw about solid G? Solid G was the one we did before that we found barium and chloride in it. So it is barium chloride. And we will stop here for this part and we will continue in part two of this review. Thank you for listening.